Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. The whole thing is very, Tate, very mysterious, Valley, but this is what I know. Authorities say a menacing letter received yesterday by a Vallejo newspaper was not sent by the infamous Zodiac Killer. That's again where it has details. That Area 51, the secret Air Force base in Nevada, actually exists. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. He's been called the East Side Rapist. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker. The original Night Stalker. And the Golden State Killer. You have now entered into the house of mystery. The best in true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. With Al Warren and Kevin Thompson. KCAA, the stations that leave no listener behind. Broadcasting on 10.50 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM. The trifecta of talk radio for Southern California. We've got Randy L. Sutton. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. It is my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I hope we're not too loony for you, but um, we, 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 we just go through some incredible days and get some incredible guests. But you are our, you're going to be today our person of sanity. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a scary thought. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you consider me your person of sanity... We got issues right now. Well, you know, let's just leave it. We do have issues, uh, and uh, but we we uh, no, you're our beacon of hope here. So um, then, <laughs> let's talk about you. Now you were um, you're a retired policeman. Um, give the listeners a little bit of history of who you are. Actually, who is Randy Sutton? Who is Randy Sutton? I've been asking that question for a long time. <laughs> and there never in, be an answer. In essence, <laughs> there probably won't be. Um, I have spent 33 years, a little more than 33 years, as a police officer in total. I spent 10 years as a cop in Princeton, New Jersey, a small town where the university is, and then got bored and joined the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, which was not boring. No. And I spent uh, a little over 23 years with them, retiring at the rank of lieutenant. And uh, so all in all, I had a very long career. Loved policing, and uh, but have done a few other things along the long road of life as well, including uh, a number of films. Uh, if you ever saw the movie Casino, I uh, I played in a scene with Robert De Niro and Sharon Stone there, and then did uh, a movie with Salma Hayek and Matthew Perry called Fools Rush In. Yeah, and then I did a film called Miss Congeniality Two with uh, with uh, um, some other uh, famous actress. And, uh, and, and actually, you and, lucky and, dog. Oh, and, and you know what? I was a lucky dog too. You're right. And then uh, I actually have a, 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 um, a, a small part in a film that will be coming out towards the end of the year uh, called uh, The Wish Man, which is going to be an incredibly, um, I, I'm going to I'm going to say entertaining film, but at the same time, um, one that. Uh, one that is going to be very inspiring. It's about the life of the creator of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, who was a, a cop when he created Make-A-Wish, uh, which is something that very few people know. And his story is, is absolutely inspiring. And I actually met him doing my last book and uh, wound up in a part of his movie in the, in the weird way that the world works. Yeah. So, uh, so the uh, it, the, uh, the the path has been interesting for me. So uh, book, movies, and then um, uh, I'm about to launch something that I think is going to be play a role in the lives of many many law enforcement officers and their families. Um, I've created an organization that is soon to be launched called the Wounded Blue, which is um, a uh, national charitable organization that assists injured and disabled police officers. Uh, and the story uh, of this is ap- will, will curl people's toes um, because they will not have any idea how badly police officers in many areas of the country are treated once they are shot, stabbed, beaten, run over by cars. It's incredible 
how many live in poverty because they have been abandoned by their departments. Well, why is that? Like, I, I don't, I, you know, there's so many things we can ask, but the, you know, in our in the country's kind of got a lot of things going on. Uh, but why is it that the departments, you say, abandon their 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 people? Well, I'm going to story, and uh, this uh, happened to me. The reason that I retired was not because I wanted to. It's because I had a stroke in my police car. Um, 2.30 in the morning, I was on patrol as the watch commander of uh, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, the ninth largest department in the country. Um, luckily, I had a patrol officer with me because when I was, uh, when I was working, I would, take a, I would take a patrol officer with me so that he could see what the lieutenant did during the shift, and I was the graveyard watch commander. And um, right in front of the famous Las Vegas Strip, I suffered a stroke, and um, that ended my career. Now, there, we have a law in the state of Nevada that says any heart condition is automatically considered a worker's compensation injury because of the, what the, the stress of the job. Um, the doctors discovered that I had a serious heart condition, which I didn't know about. Um, I had previous, just in, in, the, in just a few months, I'd had an inordinate amount of stress, which included an officer-involved shooting I was in. And um, and then uh, the doctors gave me basically a a, a life ending prognosis, uh, which was not something that I had expected. The um, the department refused to pay my medical bills. They sent me into financial ruin because they simply refused to pay them. And even though the law said you have to, I had to go to court and fight them in order to pay my medical bills. Meanwhile, the, uh, I was in collections, and I had to, you know, basically fight for my financial survival. Um, and then they lost the case, as they knew they would, and they had to pay. What was but the reason? I was lucky. There is no reasoning. The reasoning is that they hope that you will either, A, die. Now, you see, I was fortunate, because I had 23 years on the job, and I could retire, and I had income. Unfortunately... Now, if you have less than 10 years on the police department, you don't get a pension. If Correct. you get shot or stabbed or beaten or run over by a car and you cannot work, they will throw you away like an old shoe. And I can tell you that we are right in the middle of doing a documentary film now called The Wounded Blue. And um, this is going to this is going to uh, um, startle many, many people because everyone thinks that it, if you get if you're a police officer and you get and you get seriously hurt you're going to be taken care of and if you're in New York yes that's true if you're in LA yes that's true or many other places but there's so many others where not only will you not get taken care of but you may be left to live in poverty mm-hmm. and this is wow this is a, a national tragedy that very few people are aware of and it's going to be uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to create a huge awareness program and ask people to join us to help these men and women who have been so abused and literally left not only in their own devices but but the suicide rate for a police officer who's injured in the line of duty we already have a huge suicide rate but it's seven times higher if you get injured in the line of duty because of the way you're treated Right. Uh, l- let me just amend it with saying this, and Al, you are right. This one already, we're what, eight minutes <laughs> into it, and I'm already fired up. Because <laughs> our officers just working the job here in, in our state, I don't want to get too specific at this point, but in our state, they're already working at the poverty level. So imagine when our officers get injured and go with, you know, you burn your sick leave and you know, then you're on, what is it, uh, workman's comp, and then it's gone, and you're left with nothing. It, and you're right, right you're, you're right, right about exactly. the, the, the 10-year vestment. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, I, the stories that I can tell you um, will, I mean, you, you've lived it because you're in law enforcement, but you, I, I didn't even know this until it happened to me. And then, I mean, and, and like I said, I, I was okay because I had a pension coming to me. Um, this, I, I just got back. One of the here's the story. I, I, I'm gonna. 
this is one of the stories that's going to be featured in the Wounded Blue documentary. Um, I just got back from Oklahoma, and I interviewed for the film a, a, a guy who was a lieutenant on, a, on a, a, an agency. Now, they don't get paid... They don't get paid well there at all. In fact, he was working two full-time police jobs. One is a lieutenant in the county and one is a police officer at a university. And going to school, getting his master's degree, a wife and two children. This guy was a stellar, stellar police officer. One night, he gets involved in a pursuit with a, with a quote, speeder, unquote. He doesn't know that there's three hit men in that car who are on the way to kill a federal judge, they're MS-13 gang members. They open up on him during the pursuit with a high-powered rifle and hit him square in the forehead. He goes out, the car goes tumbling, he's got traumatic brain injury amongst just, you know, a plethora of, of major injuries. Um, he can no longer work. They give him $300 a month, and they're trying to take that away from him. They didn't pay his medical bills. He is in bankruptcy. It is absolutely astonishing. And, the, and, the, and, in, and in Oklahoma, you cannot find an attorney to represent you because there's no money in workers' compensation for attorneys. He's left to his own. And that's why the Wounded Blue is taking form and going to be a major force and a voice for the voiceless. I was going to say, so what does that do to a man? What does that do to someone? What did it do to you? Like as a man that's out there um, servicing the community, um, helping, and something like this happens. Uh, like, well, I, I, I can tell I, Yeah. I know, I know exactly what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying because it does affect you emotionally. It affects you mentally. Um, many of the, many of the, of the, you know, everyone has heard post-traumatic stress disorder. I call it post-traumatic stress injury because it doesn't have to be a disorder. But what happens is a police officer gets injured in the line of duty. They expect that their department is going to pay their bills, for God's sake, and, and take care of them. When it doesn't happen and they become abandoned, in fact, our motto is never forgotten, never alone, because that is the number one feeling they get. What happens is it forces post-traumatic stress to, to become part of the equation when it didn't have to be. And that means that it, it, it destroys lives. It, it increases suicide. I can't tell you how many times I have spoken to police officers and talked them down from suicide because of the way that they were treated by their own chiefs of police, by their own administrations, by their own cities, towns. It's, it's disgraceful. And ha something had to be done. And so I'm damn well doing it. Yeah, and you guys can only, like you two, both Kevin and, and you, Randy, um, because I haven't been there. But f from my point of view, um, the problem also lies in because not only are these people the people you work with, but they're also like your family in a sense, right? Like there's always, there's a, yep. something special with police. You guys are um, family, brothers. And so how does that affect your relationships with the other police? It's a dramatic effect. Many, many people feel, well, here's the, here's the, the harsh reality. That fam it's a very dysfunctional family sometimes. Yeah. And what happens <laughs> it is, is Nobody, nobody wants to think that, oh, my God, that could be me. And, and so it, it, it increases the isolation. That's why we've created an incredible peer support organization in the Wounded Blue. Every one of my officers is the Wounded Blue. They've all been shot, stabbed, beaten, run over by cars. Their stories are amazing, and their compassion is incredible, and they want to reach out, and they want to help others. And so they have become... The members of what, what we are called the peer advocacy support team. And we are, we are there for them because they should never be forgotten. They should never be alone. I went to my sheriff. Now I've served with this guy for 24 years. And when I found out when they, when they said they're not paying my bills and forced me to go to, to sue them, I went to the sheriff, a man who I'd worked with for 24 years. And I said, sheriff, 
I gave you 24 years of my life. I almost died for this organization on more than one occasion. How can you do this to me? And he looked at me dead in the eyes. Randy, nothing personal. It's just business. Yeah, oh. Exactly. Yes. I realized, <laughs> that happens. I realized that they, they didn't give a damn about me. I was now old news. So see you later. And that is devastating to someone's, you know, when, when you believe so deeply in in the commitment of the law enforcement family, and suddenly you're, you realize that they don't give a damn about you, it's very psychologically damaging. And I can tell you from, from you know, the, the number of cops that I, I literally speak to hundreds of police officers every week that are involved, that are, that are, that are facing issues. And, uh, and that's why I created this organization. I didn't want to create this organization. I can tell you right now, I have a very nice full life, and in my retirement, I didn't want to work this damn hard. But yeah. somebody has to do. Someone has to stand up to these men and women, because if if, if no one does, we're going to see the death rate rise. We're going to see the we're going to see the desperation of of our brothers and sisters who serve increase. And in this day and age, somebody's got to stand up for them. Wow. And, yeah. and let me add another aspect onto that. I, I would like to amend what Randy just said, and this is probably even more traumatizing. Uh, let's let's say, for instance, Randy is injured on the job. Now, as a fellow officer and a fellow leader, sometimes admin will take you aside and say, "Listen, Lieutenant Thompson, uh, Randy's now under administrative leave. This you know accident is under investigation. Uh, I want you to tell your troops in the next meeting. Don't speak with him." Don't get with him. Don't get involved. Leave this alone. Yes. And they further isolate that that injured officer. And that's You're traumatizing. Right. You are absolutely right. And and to the point where where people so deeply that they will take their own lives. You're absolutely right. Now here's the other part of this. The American public doesn't know about this. American public believes just as most cops believe that if a cop gets hurt in the line of duty, they're going to be taken care of. I, it incenses people when I tell them. In fact, the other day, i, I got to tell you that, that I, I fully believe that the American public, the vast majority, support, honor, and respect the American law enforcement officer. Despite what you see in the newspapers, despite what you hear in the media, it's nonsense. The vast amount of Americans believe in and, and, and support law enforcement. The other day, I have, have 26,000 Facebook followers. For, for your listeners that want to follow me, go to Randy Sutton, public figure, like the page, and you'll see everything that I write. Now, one of my Facebook uh, friends, followers, uh, I adopted a kitten, too, uh, that she knew that I, had, I adopted kittens out when I, when, I, when I find them and raise them. Mm -hmm. So I gave her a kitten, and and a couple of weeks later, I went to go pick up the um, the kitty carrier, and and she said she asked me she says what's this wounded blue thing I saw on your Facebook page, and I explained to her just like you and I just talked, and she looked at me incredulously, and she said you've got to be kidding me, she said that I never knew that that's how police were treated. Now this is just a, a woman who's just a average Joe. She went to her pocketbook. And she wrote me a check for $1,000 to the charity because of how she was so incensed about how the police are being treated. And I believe that when the American public realizes the plight and the desperation that these officers are facing, that they will want to join us. And I've created a way for them to become part of the Wounded Blue and create a better relationship and an, and an important supportive relationship between the police of this country and the citizens they serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I had no idea. This is all news to me. Um, I'm sort of in shock. You know, and, and uh, wow, the first thing I think of is that goddamn Senate and Congress get their medical covered. <laughs> yeah. you know what you know it's it's about time that we look at those people and go 
why do they uh, deserve this unlimited um, coverage for what they do, and yet people that are working the street trying to keep uh, law and order and civilization um, that, that that are facing the, the the turmoil and the things on the streets d- daily, why are we not taking care of them? As well as even our, our vets that come back, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it just confuses me all the well, hell. Well, two two reasons, Al. Um, you've got two camps. You you have the camp, uh, like Randy just said. You know they don't know. They just automatically assume you're a public servant, so the public is going to take care of you when you're down. Yeah. Then you've got then you've got the other camp that has redeveloped. Well, you deserve this, you pig. You know you you sob. How dare you? <laughs> I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. Randy. Sorry. No, no, you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, I can't tell you how many people have have uh, uh, said or written that, hey, you signed up for this when you became a cop. You know, and, and here's, you know, here's the thing. Um, a lot of people, you know, it, depending on, on what area of the country, salaries vary from one end of the spectrum to the next, right? Yeah. Uh, um, you can be a police officer in in, say, Westchester, New York, and you're going to be making a hell of a living. You can be a cop in, uh, in Alabama, and you're basically in the poverty level. Um, <laughs> you're making $30,000 a year. <laughs> Absolutely and, true. So <laughs> it, it's the, 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 um, the difference in, in salaries is amazing. One, one, on my radio show, I, one of the things, I, I have a radio show called Blue Lives Radio, the voice of American law enforcement. And um, I do a... Every 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 show, I do a one show a week. I do a um, a memorial for every cop who's been killed in the line of duty that week. But I, I was I was talking about this officer who, twenty year vet officer in Pennsylvania. Um, he died when he was shot to death um, on a on a domestic dispute. And a couple of days later, I heard from his partner, and he said, "Randy, I don't think you're aware of this." But he was making nine dollars and twelve cents an hour when he was killed. Holy! And I, I was shocked. I was shocked. I said, "He's a twenty-year cop. He wasn't even on duty. They they called him at, from home because there was no the state police were so far away. And he gave his life in the line of duty for nine dollars and twelve cents an hour. This is this is a, not only is it is it astounding. It's a tragedy." that we are paying police officers that ridiculous amount of money to give their lives and, and to risk their lives. It's, a, it's shameful. Wow. So, wow. so, so the, the, the question is inevitably going to come up from the listeners then, Randy. Ooh, a, a, given that, you know, a lot of people imagine that cops make money. But given that, $9 an hour. What keeps an officer in a job that pays less than the quickie mark guy? It's it, it because <laughs> it, it's a calling because they believe in something greater than themselves. They believe that what they are doing is important. It's important to their to their community. It's important to them personally because they are standing up for what they believe in. Um, I don't know if, if you guys are aware of this, and and probably the, the many of the listeners are not either, and that is that there's only 700,000 full-time law enforcement officers in this in the United States. 700,000 to police more than 320 million people. Now, and those are, if, and if those are the documented people. Yeah, those are the documented people, exactly. <laughs> but but there, there are thousands, thousands of reserve officers in this country from from uh, mostly um, in the midwestern states and the and the and the mid mid states, who work sometimes for twenty years as uniform law enforcement for no pay at all. They actually work. They put on the uniform. They are sworn officers. They go out and serve their communities just like every other cop, and they don't get paid at all. Are you referring to the reserves? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
and it's um, it's astounding. I I was just uh, I did a speaking engagement in Utah um, to a for a law enforcement appreciation dinner, and I and I found out that the it was a this was a huge county, thousands of square miles. They only had 25 full-time cops, but they had 25 reserves who made up the rest of the department. And some of these guys have worked for 20 years doing, they're risking their lives for no pay at all. These are dedicated people. And, but this is, this is, um, and they face the same issue. If they get hurt in the line of duty, they're screwed too. Now, now, um, I, I, I want, I, I'm, I'm just in shock. But we had the uh, old Seattle chief of police on, and because um, I, I think that um, we'll have a lot of listeners that um, will, will, I, I, I don't even want to get into it. But they're, they're gonna, you know, they complain a lot about, you know, the cops should be wearing cameras when that happened, and all the shootings oh. and all that stuff, right? So what mm-hmm. we want to bring up here is <clears throat> a lot of a lot of the shootings that happen are happening because of um, not trained enough police do you believe that there there is a uh, there is a huge disparity in training from one side of the country to the next um, I was one of the jobs I had for my entire career was I was involved in training uh, literally uh, for for 25 years um i was a field training officer uh and then during one of my supervisory positions i was in charge of advanced training for the entire las vegas metropolitan police department and um what i i had to fight for for a budget to train our people and we were a very well trained organization but i can tell you this you can go to uh, to uh, a department in in Pennsylvania or a department in Arizona, and and you will get two entirely different sets of of, um, of of trainings. And um, one you may go to the range once a year. Uh, one you may go to the range every every three months and have to qualify. But it's different everywhere, and there is there is a lack of training in a lot of police departments. And so what happens is um, we, we, we don't equip our officers with the knowledge that they need and the equipment that they need and the training that they need, and then when they screw up, we put them in prison. Uh-huh. Yeah. And this is, this, is a, this is a travesty, a travesty. I had, um, I had a guest on my radio show uh, last week whose name you will probably know. Her name is Betty Shelby. She was a police officer in Tulsa. He killed uh, um, a suspect who was who was uh, on PCP, um, non-compliant. Reached into his truck and she shot him. She she was arrested and charged with murder. She was found not guilty because she was not guilty, and she was a well-trained officer. But what she found out during this terrible process was she was abandoned by her agency, and and if you. Luckily, she had a great defense and, and had the money behind her to mount that defense, which showed her training and showed that she was reacting as her training um, showed her to be. The problem is that in, in, in many departments, they get barely just the, 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 the bare bones training, and then when they screw up, the, the 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 political machine is ready to chew them up, spit them out, and sacrifice them on the altar of political correctness. Right, right. That's that's sort of I think my point yeah. is that how he was saying that you know people just automatically assume <clears throat> sorry that 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 these uh, officers you know they like he gets the comments of oh why didn't they just shoot him in the leg or why didn't you know the the generic comments they get. <laughs> yeah. and he said he said most of my new officers couldn't hit you in the back of the leg 
Right. And, and <laughs> a smaller sl- target. Yeah, he wasn't slamming them. He was just saying, listen, this is what I've got to work with. These people have six weeks training. They're put in really bad parts of town. They have no experience in dealing with it. And instead of calling them a racist or saying, you know, you're just out to kill a black person because you're white. Yeah, or they uh, acted stupidly. Yeah, that, that we have to look at the whole picture. We have to look at what is going on. What? Are, how are these men being... Um, assist it by us as a society. They're hired from us to take care of our communities. We need to have them a part of our communities, and we need to give them the training and resources that they need in order to support that. And, um, and yeah, you, the, the, the mainstream media... <laughs> There's that word, which we're part of, <laughs> uh, is, is, is sort of not, not jumping on that. I know there's a lot of... Uh, in the community of our community that just jump on it. Um, you know, well, you, so, you talked well, about, you talked about the Seattle police chief, right? All right. Let me tell you how screwed up Seattle is. Oh, uh, we know. Uh Oh, uh Oh, <laughs> no, we know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I just, uh, I had the, uh, the head of the police union on my show not long ago, uh, because when I, I saw how, how, um, uh, they treated a, a hero officer who um, who used force that 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 any cop would have done in any set of situations, and and they blasted him for it and brought him up on charges and all kinds of the the, the, the police department itself is um, is so screwed up because of the political correctness that um, that it's uh, they're eating they're eating their their young is really what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to... Um, I'm trying to see how, how we resolve this, but I think, for me, a lot of people don't have these real conversations, but everyone is trying to be too correct, and they say the same generic things. That There's no real uh, talking. There's no uh, bringing the police into the fold and finding out what needs to be addressed in order to make it a better working situation you know well there, there's a couple reasons for that and that is because the, the the police department makes a very convenient whipping boy for politicians right um that it's a it's a, it's a hot button issue you can see that uh what from you know you you look at at uh look at uh hillary clinton and her reaction to law enforcement during the uh, during the campaign, when she um, refused to allow police officers, uh, she didn't want them shown uh, in the uh, uh, on the television, and instead brought up people who had strong anti law enforcement. In, in fact, even inciting violence against law enforcement, she was the people that those were the people she was she was looking to for support. So you you get you get these pandering politicians. You get um, uh, community activists, quote unquote, which get all the media, even though they're nonsensical in what their approach is, and then people start thinking, well, gee, maybe there is something to all this, 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 wow, this police brutality insanity. And so, even though it's, it, it is, in essence, it's a, it's a, a big made up bunch of garbage. If you tell people enough over and over again that that uh, institutionalized police racism exists, people start believing it, even though it's completely untrue. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, you know, and there's always going to be uh, good and bad. I just don't know, you know, like these federal politicians, because even, even on, the, on the Trump side, how, you know, nothing really changes, doesn't matter who's in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they can talk yeah, I know, the game. I know, they can talk. What, I know very much what you need. But he, I got to tell you, President Trump is the first law enforcement supporter in the president in, in the president's seat since George Bush. Um, I can tell you a couple a personal story. Yeah. Um, I, I was uh, the assistant commander of the police department's honor guard, and uh, which was one of the most difficult jobs I did, but one of the most. Um, powerful in, in, in its emotions because we buried our, our own police officers, those who gave their lives in the line of duty and after their service. Uh, I would go to Washington each year 
where uh, the police memorial is, where every name of every cop who's been killed in the line of duty is engraved in the granite of our memorial. And there is a poli- there is a um, each week in May there's Police Week, where we unveil the names of all those cops who've been killed that year. George Bush, um, and he never made this public, spent hours with the families privately who had been killed in the line of duty. And uh, the only other person to to show that much regard for law enforcement is uh, is, is Donald Trump. Um, Obama hated cops, and he made made it very clear that he did. He didn't even show up for Police Week sometimes. Um, and 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 uh, but Donald Trump truly cares about law enforcement officers. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I sort of, I, I, I don't believe that. I, I think that um, he talks the game, but I don't think he's, he, he does anything. He, he truly loves and he just gave, he just gave, he just gave, he just allowed hundreds of millions of dollars to be put forth to um, assist law enforcement officers in the study of post-traumatic stress to assist them. Uh, no one ever, ever yeah. has done that before. No, and that's good enough. But I, 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 I still think he could do better. I, I well, think he, I, well, you know. sure, I sure as hell agree with you. They could yeah. do better, and yeah. and yeah. I'm and I'm going to ask them to do better. That's right. You you tell them. <laughs> they, I mean, as as an entire Congress, they could all uh, yeah, do better. I mean, Al, Al yeah. made a good point early on. Yeah. Um, you know, you've you've got these officers out there putting their lives on the line. I mean. And I say this at great risk to myself, having, you know, living on both sides, even more than military. You know, I mean, they're out there facing unknown situations daily as cops. But you've got Congress, you know, hey, I I could sure use a raise. Let's vote on it. Okay, great. You know, nobody does that for us. Exactly. No, no, no. And and. Police, law enforcement is nothing but an afterthought and kind of a, an inconvenient um, um, stepchild to uh, Congress and the Senate. They, uh, the, the, there are a few that have taken up some causes, and there has actually been a little movement um, in, in some places to make the plight better, uh, but there's never, there still is not a... Uh, a consensus, and there's not been a, a major effort on the part of any lawmaker to really address this situation. And, and uh, I'm hoping that the wounded blue, in my role as the as the founder and president, um, that we are going to become a force to be reckoned with when it comes to this issue. Yeah. Now, having said that, uh, let, let's go back to President Trump, and, and I am, <laughs> for the record, a Trump supporter. But rather than just giving grants and giving money, couldn't he just say, much like I believe it was Reagan did with the uh, air traffic controllers, hey, you are going to pay this. You, this is just the way it is. I have a phone and I have a pen, and I'm going to make this happen. Well, I, you know what? I, I would love to get the opportunity to sit before him and ask him that. And who knows that may happen. Um, I'm, I believe that I believe that that I will get a, uh, an audience with President Trump. Uh, I believe that that we will have this discussion, and uh, and then I'll let you know what he says. How about that? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> now I will support that. I'd like to be in the room for that. Um, it, let, let's go back to a let's revisit a, a prior point because I'd like to get your take on this. Um, Al was asking about. You know, shootings and the way that the public perceives officer involved shootings. Um, in my humble opinion, I think that the community or society is getting two things confused, and that is skill and judgment. I, I can go out in the range and I can shoot 100 out of 100. No problem. But when it comes to officer involved shootings, it's not just skills. I probably could hit a guy in the leg, and I'm bragging a little bit here. You know, that's what cop that's what cops do. But pulling that weapon and actually firing it in in a you know crisis situation is a complete other issue. 
And society, I don't think society sees it that way. Oh, he shot that person for no reason. No, there's this thing, weird thing called the totality of circumstances. And society doesn't understand that. And that's where judgment comes in. Uh, am I just rambling or am I making sense, Randy? No, you're, you're not rambling at all. You make, you make all the sense in the world. And let me, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, I have to tell you this uh, as, so you understand where I'm coming from. I am the survivor of, uh, of police combat. I've been involved in police combat on more than one occasion. Um, I, I've had to take a, a life before. Uh, I've had to defend my own life in a, in a gunfight situation on more than one occasion. And I can tell you this, that, that um, anybody that believes that police officers are out there to gun people down are absolutely out of their freaking mind, okay? It right. lives with you forever to take the life of another human being, no matter how justified you are in doing it, will always play a role in the rest of your life. Now, that being said, the skill level that a police officer has and the way that they act under, under uh, circumstances Duress. is all about training and experience, and we are failing our cops because we are devoting... Uh, um, uh, precious training hours to politically correct training instead of officer survival training. Police officers need to have the skills and they need to have the, the, the training to survive. What has been happening in the police community, mostly it started under Obama, was that, that the law enforcement leadership started changing the parameters of training to um, uh, respond to politically correct training. Now, every cop can only be can only get so much training because they have their shifts to run, they got their vacation time, they got their days off. So there's a limited amount of training that you can get. What has been happening is we have been we have forced these cops to go into um, implicit bias training for hours and hours. De-escalation, which is the latest buzzword bingo. In <laughs> yeah, forcing cops, forcing cops to instead of making sound decisions based on tactics and 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 uh, in defense of their own lives, we're forcing them to think of alternatives in the heat of battle, which which is costing cops their lives. And and this is the inconvenient truth that you will not hear from the chiefs of police because they're a bunch of gutless wonders that don't have the balls to stand up for their own cops. <laughs> Touche. Amen. <laughs> I'm staying out of that one. That, that, I, think you're, I think you're right. I think that... Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I yeah. Don't know. When, do, when do you choose to take a life? I mean... Uh, let's put that out to society. I mean, let, let's take a poll. I, I mean, they're always like, well, he didn't have to shoot him. You weren't there. It, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback. But, uh, you know, for well, example, the, 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 you're, you're I'm sorry. All of these, you're seeing all of these prosecutions of police officers, which you've never seen before. Um, uh, Betty Shelby, perfect example. The, uh, the officers in Baltimore in the Freddie Gray case, you are seeing Jason Shockley, Stockley, excuse me, who was brought to trial, a uh, Hoppy Hopper, who was in the Southern Justice. All of these officers who, who, after the fact, had been arrested and tried for murder, and every single one of them has gotten off, not because the system is fixed, but because they weren't guilty. And if they had, if they had get, been given a fair shake to begin with, they never would have been charged. But we are creating an environment now where police officers are scared to death to do their jobs because they are afraid to become the next Darren Wilson, who now, by the way, the, with the new district attorney who is going to be elected, is now threatening to arrest him for murder. Mm. Now, in the effort of fairness, though, <laughs> uh, let's, let, let's look at a couple of situations, uh, Randy, where we've done damage to ourselves. And this one, I bet I... I'll bet you $10, and I've got it right here on the desk, that this is going to turn racial. The woman in Houston, the female officer who, and I'm air quoting, went into the wrong apartment last week and shot that man. How do we oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, yeah. you know where that's going. What do we say? Yeah. What do we do? How do we how do we do damage control on something like we we did that ourselves? I and for the record, I'm saying this on our show. I don't believe her story. I I cannot give you a single time I've walked into the neighbor's house and shot my neighbor. You know. I, well, this is your fault. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is, right. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. This is a mess. Um, this is, uh, you know, I, I, although I don't, I don't think that that uh, that you've heard the, the the whole story here. Um, there is absolutely no set of circumstances here where where this is going to come out good for the police. It's not going to happen. I mean, this was uh, he's. She's going to go to jail. Um, there's, there's, you know, you, we have to look at, we have to look at um, the totality of the circumstances, the reasonableness, and believe me, there are bad shootings. There are bad shootings. They happen. Now they don't happen nearly as frequently as the media would have you believe they happen. But when they do, we have to be held accountable. You know, when I read this, I looked at it the same way what you just said. And I said, wait, wait a minute, hold on a second. Now, I've heard a few more facts that came out, mm-hmm. but no matter how you cut it, um, you're in the wrong apartment, and you kill a guy that's in his own home. Sorry, uh, this one ain't flying. Yeah. So well, I, well, when, when, the, when these bad shootings happen, we have to face the music about it. And we can't, we can't alter the facts. We can't. We can't sugarcoat it. We got to say, you know what? This was a bad one. We're going to make amends for it, and and somebody's going to have to pay the piper. As as much as I hate to say it, I I think jail time is in order here. And, and what made this even more cringeworthy is I'm reading the stories and making phone calls and you know people calling me about it. It. What, and I'm not trying to be ugly or politically incorrect. You have a white female officer shooting an unarmed black citizen in his home. And there's, oh, no, yeah. there's no good explanation for it. No, no, no. It, no, it, does, it does not get any worse. I'm, I am, I'm, I'm with you completely on this one. So was that training? Was that judgment? I mean, those are those things that society doesn't understand. Or well, I, you know what? Was it a love interest gone bad? Now that sounds conspiratorial, but <laughs> honest to God, Randy, that's what I thought. Maybe. <laughs> well, and, and this is where this is where a a, a full fledged homicide investigation has to take place. If there turns out that there was a relationship there that they even knew each other, it, it will bring a, a completely different dimension to this. But you know, keep in mind, there there are cops out there that a shouldn't be police officers that somehow got through the system. I mean, look. Well, for, let's talk about this for a minute. Look at the situation um, in uh, in Milwaukee, where a uh, a police officer, excuse me, Minneapolis, I think it is, where a Somali yes. police officer killed a completely innocent woman, and uh, and I and I had been very very critical of this mayor and police chief at the time. Uh, Jenny Harto was the police chief, and this mayor uh, who were so incredibly liberal that they. They were they were anti police. <laughs> That's how liberal they were. Well, she hired this guy, a policeman named uh, Noor, who was from the Somali community, and paraded him around like a like a circus pony, showing the world how liberal she was in hiring this guy, even though he didn't do any police work. You know, he, as soon as he got hired, they she started throwing him out there and the you know doing community events, et cetera, and so forth. Well. I knew, I knew it just from, from the reading of between the lines, and now it's been confirmed during that he never should have been to begin with, and never should have been retained. But because of political correctness, was he didn't fit the psychological profile. He was antisocial. He was lazy. 
He didn't do police work. All of the train officers said <laughs> that he shouldn't be retained, and they hired him and retained him anyway due to pressure from the chief, who, by the way, was forced to resign after this happened. Yeah. This was happening in enforcement. So now this we get we get hit the entire profession gets hit with a black eye because of political reasons someone is hired and someone is retained when they shouldn't be and then people say well, well look at those bad police well wait a minute it's because of political correctness and this is happened believe me this isn't this isn't the last time we're going to see more of this because we are seeing we are seeing um a diminishment of recruitment, a diminishment of retention, and a lowering of standards in order to get cops into uniform and a lack of training. This is the perfect... Well, thank you very much, and I hope we can do it again. There's so much to talk about, um, yeah, you know, and, and you're the man to do it. Yes, I and it's been an absolute pleasure. Away. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you, and to your listening audience, Thank you for your support of the American Law Enforcement Officer. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.